You're not going to believe how much Gen Z and Millennials will need saved up to retire. 4 in 10 Millennials won't have enough money to retire by 70. Wharton says Millennials are going to be poor forever. Scary stuff, guys. Not trying to be a negative Nancy here, but if you're watching this video, you're probably going to have a pretty hard time retiring. More than 80% of the audience for these videos are Millennial and Gen Z. And unfortunately, pretty much every financial news outlet has been writing articles this week about how impossible it's going to be for all of us to retire. So let's take a deep dive into some of these articles and sort of get a gist of what the state of millennial retirement is in the United States. And then if you guys stick around until the end of the video, I'll be covering some of the traditional tried and true retirement vehicles, as well as some alternatives that have become really popular with millennials. Hopefully then you'll have a little bit better of an idea of what your options are, and you'll be able to walk away from this video feeling a little bit more confident about your financial future. If you guys are new to this channel, my name's Rhett. I'm a software engineer and entrepreneur living here in Houston, Texas. And I make videos here on YouTube to help you get smarter and live a more successful life. So first, let's go ahead and talk about how much money we're going to need to retire. An MSN article from earlier in the week is citing this wealth care financial report that's claiming that Gen Z and millennials need $500,000 by the age of 25 in order to be on track for retirement. This is a completely shocking number. Even the 17 year old that's living in Dubai that recently sold me a drop shipping course doesn't have that much money. Next up is $1 million by 40, which seems more possible, but is still kind of crazy. And then $2 million by 50 and $3 million by 60. The article goes on to say that if you're not at those very lofty targets, don't worry about it because the median adult in America between 25 and 34 has about $14,000 in retirement savings. Yikes. That's only 10 to 100 times off from what Wealthcare wanted you to have. No big deal, right? These targets from Wealthcare seem absurdly high. I'm not sure how they came about their calculations for how much money you'll need in retirement. It's possible that they just had very high inflation expectations. Fidelity's general guidelines for how much money you'll need in retirement are by the age of 67, you should have 10 times your salary saved up, which means that if you were making $100,000, then by age 67, you would want $1 million saved up in your account. I think pretty much no one has $500,000 net worth when they're 25, but maybe Wealthcare's numbers are more accurate than Fidelity's. They just seem pretty high to me. The story out of Wharton this week was very similar to that MSN story about Wealthcare, suggesting that while millennials might have a lot of money in retirement, that money is not going to take them as far as it used to now that we're living in this super inflationary environment. So you might have a lot of money on paper when you retire, but that money is not actually going to buy you the lifestyle that you thought it was going to. And if we head over to Barron's, the data for millennials doesn't get much better. 38% of millennials that were born in the 80s, the early millennials, will have quote unquote inadequate income by the time that they turn 70. And this is due to social security benefits getting smaller, the fact that pensions have largely gone away and aren't really a thing anymore. And then the kicker that we already talked about that no no one is really investing the amount of money that they should into their 401k accounts. This 38% of millennials will have inadequate income in retirement is compared to the 30% of baby boomers and the 35% of Gen X at the same periods of time. So it is trending upwards, which theoretically would make it even worse for Gen Z. So overall, if we sort of aggregate the data from these three articles, the picture that they're painting for retirement in America for millennials is that most people aren't saving enough. Even if you are saving a lot, you might need way more money than you thought you would in retirement to have the same lifestyle because of inflation. And the problem overall is getting worse and worse because of income inequality in America and the fact that 40% of Americans still have zero investable assets. So every time there's a big market rally and the stock market never comes down below that point again, 40% of Americans are locked out of those gains. Traditionally, retirement advice from financial analysts, my favorite writers, and financial media has been to invest in stock indexes because here comes the famous stat. Stock indexes have gone up an average of 10% a year for the last 50 years. If you've been following this channel, hopefully you're already well aware of that stat, it gets talked about all the time. But for the 87% of you that are watching this right now that are not subscribed, go subscribe. It's free and it will help make your brain bigger, thank you. That stat gets repeated all the time, but obviously just like everything else in this channel, none of this is financial advice. And just because it happened in the last 50 years doesn't mean that it's going to happen in the next 50 years. The fancy finance way of talking about this 10% average growth rate per year statistic is called compounding annual growth rate or CAGR. And CAGR basically means if we analyze an asset over some period of time and we smoothed out the growth to be the same number every year, what would that number be? If for example, we compare the CAGR of the S&P 500 to the Vanguard total market fund, we can see that over the last 20 years, they've both increased about 8% before inflation, not the 10% per year that always gets brought up. And if you check over five years and over three years, the numbers get even worse. It comes down to about 7% 
10% over both of those time frames. And obviously here over this last year, it's called trailing 12 months here on this chart. Both of these markets are down between 15 and 18%. So not really great recently in this last year, but that's why it's really important to look at this CAGR number over a long period of time when we're talking about retirement funds. Because really what happens over one year doesn't totally matter to your retirement. What really matters is, is it getting that 10% per year CAGR over a 20 year and a 50 year time horizon? So the stock market isn't doing as well as that 10% statistic might lead you to believe over these last 20 years, but what's one or 2% between friends, right? Next, let's go ahead and look at bond performance and compare it to those stock numbers that we just took a look at. Big old oof here from the bonds. The BND bond fund CAGR here over the last 10 years is about negative 2% per year and negative half a percent per year over the last 15 years. And all of that is before inflation expectations. Unfortunately, the fund hasn't existed long enough for us to get good 20 year data, but you can sort of see where this is going. And that's that bonds are a contract that are programmed to devalue over long periods of time. Basically, bonds don't make money long term. And this is for a handful of different reasons. And if you guys are interested in me doing a full breakdown on bonds, go ahead down in the comments and let me know. I think that would be better off as its own video or a series of videos because there is a lot to cover just specifically in the bond market. All right, all right, all right. So bonds suck and they're giving us really bad performance, but why do we care? The real problem with bonds is that if you're in one of these crazy target date retirement funds that everyone initially opts into as part of their 401k, it's sort of just like pick this fund, pick the date that you're going to retire. Now you're part of the 2060 Vanguard Retirement Fund or the JP Morgan Chase 2070 Fund or something like that. If you're in one of these target date funds that 401ks default you into, not only is that not getting 10% because stocks haven't done 10% a year on their CAGR, they've only done 8% like we just saw, it's also doing even worse than that 8% because bond returns have been negative before inflation over the last 10 and 15 years. Even if we look at the most aggressive target date fund that's set for 2070, we can see that about 10% of the fund is in bonds and international bond indexes. So if you were getting 8% from your stocks and negative 2% from your bonds for the last 10 years, you wouldn't be averaging an 8% return with your 90-10 bonds equity split. You would actually be averaging a 7% return over that same period of time. And as these target date funds get closer to their target date, so if, for example, we look at the 2040 fund, the split between stocks and bonds is no longer 90-10, it's now 80-20. So you have twice as many bonds now, and that's driving your return down from 7% to 6% using the numbers that we used in the last equation. And if you take it all the way to the 2025 fund, it is now not an 80-20 split stocks and bonds. It is a 50-50 split stocks and bonds, which has taken your blended average down from 6% to only 3%. So this 10% figure that all these articles cite is actually super optimistic for most people who just park their money in their 401ks in these watered down target date funds. So what's the answer here for millennials? It sort of seems like we all need to moonlight as hedge fund managers just to be able to retire. There are really three levers that you can pull to get ahead for retirement. The first lever is obviously learn to live on less money, which is something that people are probably tired of hearing about. It sort of comes off as preachy and this video has been negative enough already. So let's put that one to the side for now. The second lever is making more money so that you have more money to be able to invest. And the third lever is obviously get a higher return on your money than the S&P 500 or the stock market average, which is difficult to do over long periods of time, but lots of people in the world do it. And again, this video has already been super negative so far. So let's go ahead and focus on the two positive levers that we can pull here, lever number two and lever number three. The first thing that we can all focus on is leveling up our skills to increase our earning potentials. Naval Ravikant talks about the five most important skills being reading, writing, arithmetic, persuasion, which is basically just talking, and then finally computer programming. Maybe you're already an accountant, so you're really good at arithmetic, but you pick up computer programming and now you're way more valuable in your current job because you can do a bunch of technical things. And then after that, you take up persuasion and then you become a manager of other accountants who are now working underneath you and you have a lot more leverage. Or maybe you're a computer programmer and you take up writing video scripts and persuasion talking to a bunch of people on YouTube about the things that you're interested in reading. The bottom line is that the combination of these five different skills can really take you in a lot of different directions no matter what industry you're already in. One of the ways that I got super interested in personal finance and started to take the topic more seriously in my own life was by reading a lot of different books. My favorites are I Will Teach You To Be Rich by Ramit Sethi and A Random Walk Down Wall Street by Burton Malkiel. I'm usually pretty busy so I like to listen to books so that I can do something else while 
online learning. And you can do the same thing and get either of those books for free by using Audible, which I'll leave a link to down in the description. I've used Audible now for five years and it's a great way to introduce yourself to a new topic or learn a new skill. The bottom line is that when you drastically increase your earning potential by learning new skills and keep your lifestyle costs the same, you now have way more money to invest than you did before and you get to take advantage of compound interest. And when you're investing a lot more money, it doesn't matter as much that you're getting 8% or 7% as opposed to 10%. If you're completely turned off by the idea of investing altogether, the other trend that millennials have taken to is that we're starting our own businesses younger and in more volume than any generation before us. Following the trend of investing in yourself and starting your own business is seen by society as the super risky thing to do. But in reality, it's one of the best ways to outperform the stock market over a long period of time. And as Naval has noted, you're not going to get rich renting out your time. You have to own equity, a piece of a business to gain your financial freedom. If you look at almost any rich person, they've gotten rich, not from like being a doctor or some employee at something. They've gotten rich from owning a piece of a business, driving that business to great successes, and then selling piece of that business or just continuing to ride that out. Alex Hormozzi talks about it as investing in the S and Me 500 instead of the S and P 500. The S and Me 500 might feel a little riskier, but it's also probably a lot more fun, and the potential for returns are much much higher than the S and P 500. Additionally, when you are building your own business, you can always learn more and personally mitigate any of the risks that come up that could take you out of business. Whereas if you're investing in Walmart, you have no control over the business risks that Walmart is taking, for example. Finally, there's my personal favorite investment, Bitcoin, which has a CAGR that blows the S&P 500 out of the water, not financial advice. If you do want to learn more about Bitcoin and its massive CAGR, go ahead and click on the video over here. Hopefully this video was helpful for you today, guys. I love you all. See you next week. <laughs>